Uh, I'm Michael Jossid. I'm uh, here with Robert Doucette, a 22-year veteran of the Air Force, and uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about his uh, Air Force time and service. Uh, Robert? I started out and went to Lackland Air Force Base for my basic training, and while I was there I had an aptitude test and they thought I would be good in electronics. So they sent me to Kiesel Air Force Base for my training, and I went to there and worked on uh, basic electronics, and then came time to decide what I was going to do for a career, they decided that I should do ground radar. So I went to school on ground radar, and uh, my first assignment after school was at Dover Foxcroft, Maine, a little radar site. Um, I was only there for about a year, and they decided that they needed me down at Otis Air Force Base, and they cross-trained me into airborne radar maintenance. So that's where I started my 20 years of flying the radar constellation as part of a crew. And uh, while I was there, uh, I went through numerous uh, schooling, uh, a year at Keesler, and then uh, at Otis, I got there in another 25 weeks of, of school there. So I had a lot of uh, education in electronics my first uh, few years mm -hmm. in, in the service. Um, uh, Otis was uh, uh, a great place in the summertime, but uh, not much in the wintertime. They rolled up the sidewalks and, and, uh, in the wintertime, and we, uh, uh, I recall that one of my, going out for one of my missions, I had a Volkswagen bug, and uh, I uh, got stuck on the side of the road, so I, I parked my car there, and uh, the security police brought me out to the flight line. We took off and flew our mission and recovered in Bermuda. But when I got back to Otis, I couldn't find my car. Um, snow banks were about eight feet high, and uh, they had buried my car. So I... Uh, Dug out about three other cars before I got mine out, and then, <laughs> but that was uh, one of my t good times at, at, <laughs> at Otis. Uh, uh, after Otis, uh, I was transferred to McClellan Air Force Base in Sacramento, again uh, flying the Radar Constellations. Uh, the Radar Constellations was part of the uh, uh, air defense system that we had. Um, on the East Coast, we had the stations uh, two, four, and six, and on the West Coast, we had stations one, three, and and nine, uh, and, and uh, some of our stations were um, north and some of them were south, um, but we patrolled the whole coast. And when we first started, um, we always relieved each other on stations, so we had continuous. Uh, radar out there. 24 hours. 24 hours a day, seven mm -hmm. days a week. Um, the Texas Towers was also part of our, our uh, operation there. And uh, while I was at Otis, uh, that Texas Tower 3 went down and we lost all those people and we disbanded the Texas Towers after that. Oh. So that was uh, uh, one of the uh, things that happened while I was at, at Otis. Mm -hmm. um, also while I was at Otis Air Force Base, uh, uh, we lost uh, three aircraft. Um, this was in uh, the 70s, and uh, the uh, three aircraft that we lost were, were lost in three consecutive years. And that's the only three aircraft that we lost in the whole 20, 20 years that I was in the service. Uh, our aircraft were in the inventory for about 25 years. And those were only three aircraft that, that were lost. That's a pretty good record. Yes, it was. It was an excellent record. Mm -hmm. you know, I felt very safe on that, on that aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, we surmised from what happened. Uh, I was on one of the uh, teams that investigated uh, why these aircraft crashed. And, and we surmised that uh, it could have very well been that when we turned on our radar that... Um, 
spark generated. We found out that we had uh, uh, fuel in one of the gas tanks and the spark ignited the gas tank and blew the aircraft up. Mm. And uh, we felt that that's probably what happened on all three aircraft. So uh, we are not sure that that was what it was. They could never get a firm, uh, but we surmise that that's what happened. And, they took and, steps then to, to make sure that they... W what they did is they uh, took that fuel area and, uh, and shut it off and, right. and didn't use Eliminate. it anymore and put in uh, water in that tank. Right. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, but it was fumes more than anything else that probably caused it. Mm -hmm. uh, they only had slush fuel in it as it was. But uh, that's what uh, we determined that perhaps caused the aircraft. And it, it was interesting that this was an EC-121H aircraft, which had uh, uh, new equipment on it, uh, different equipment than we had on on the, the other aircraft. We had the same radar system, but we had a lot of uh, data processing equipment on that one oh, that right. uh, we didn't have on, on, on the others. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, uh, out of Otis uh, and out of uh, McClellan Air Force Base, I uh, did spend some time in, in Vietnam, uh, seven different occasions. I uh, Starting about? TDY. Um, TDY um, in the uh, 60s, uh, mid 60s, and early 70s, um, I was in uh, I was in uh, uh, TDY there, and I also spent uh, 13 months in Guangzhou, Korea, um, uh, in 72 to 73. That was our main operating base for the radar constellations and our forward operating base was out of Tonsonut in Saigon, Vietnam. And uh, we would fly uh, out of, uh, I would fly a lot of the aircraft from Korea to, uh, we'd stop in Thailand and then we'd head on over to uh, Saigon. And normally when I brought one over, I would bring another one back. To, to work on at the mm -hmm. main, main maintenance. Maintenance. We did all of our main inspections and all of our uh, time inspections back mm -hmm. at the main operating base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Our missions out of Tonsonu uh, uh, were uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin mainly. Um, we would fly uh, 25 to 75 feet off the water to be under enemy radar. And uh, I've seen times when we had to uh, climb because we were getting the sea spray on the windshield. That's uh, awfully low. Oh, yeah. And, and then uh, times when we had to climb to go over an aircraft carrier. So that was interesting as well. And uh, but we had contact with that aircraft carrier. And <laughs> right. they, thought we, they asked us if we were going to try to land on the deck. <laughs> and we assured them that we were only uh, patrolling the area. <laughs> And uh, uh, I also was on uh, one of the first crews that went to Iceland. And we had a ground radar site that blew over. And we were going up there for a, uh, just a temporary uh, two-week stay. Uh, <laughs> nine years later, they uh, uh, stopped our missions in Iceland. Uh, it seems like the first week we were there, we were flying... Uh, uh, a regular mission, and we scrambled the jets out of uh, Keflavik there, and and uh, they kind of said to us, well, "What did you really see?" And we said, "We told them that there was Russian bears out there, and they were heading down towards Cuba." And and uh, they said, "Nah, they can't be islands." You know, they said, "We've been here f forever, and we've never seen one." Well. Consequently, the radar constellations uh, ended up being a mainstay there for the next nine years because uh, they were flying under the uh, radar mm -hmm. and they couldn't pick them up with their ground ground based radar. Mm -hmm. But with our radar being uh, able to uh, pick all the way up from from the bottom, the sea all the way up to 
250 miles, we had a, we had a big eye. And mm -hmm. that's what the name of our operation was, Big Eye. Oh. Big Eye in, uh, in Vietnam. Um, so uh, uh, our uh, unit was, uh, uh, we were the Air Force Outstanding Unit uh, five different times, and two times with Valor. Uh, so uh, we were well decorated uh, Outstanding. As, as, a, uh, as a group as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be proud of that. Yes, I'm very proud of that. And uh, also uh, air medals. I, I have um, uh, uh, air medal with four oak leaf clusters. So I've had five air medals and uh, meritorious service medal, two yeah. Air Force Outstanding Unit Awards, uh, two um, Air Force Meritorious Service too as well. Mm -hmm. so, uh, other than the regular campaign medals and the, and the Vietnam medals. And, and um, of course, we had to uh, qualify uh, as uh, marksmen as well, because we carried uh, uh, M16s in our aircraft in case we ever got shot down, that we mm -hmm. would have some, some protection for us there. And uh, they, uh, so uh, I would. Unfortunately, never had to use them. No, unfortunately. Well, we used them a couple times. Okay, we were getting ground fire from from uh, sand pans areas, and oh. uh, and we uh, had to use them for to protect our, ourselves there. We got out of that area. But uh, uh, speaking of sand pans, that was a that was an interesting thing in the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, yeah. Whenever we flew out there, the uh, sand pans would try to get under our aircraft. And one of the reasons they would try to get under our aircraft is we had uh, ready-to-eat meals. Well, we didn't care for those ready-to-eat meals, so we threw them out the aircraft to the sand pans. And they loved them. They would fight for them down there in the water. You could see them <laughs> fighting for them. You know, and that was a thing. Um, did, you, did you throw out a case at a time? Or did no, you th we threw out one individual? package, uh, independent, oh. individual package oh, yeah. at a time. And we tried to throw them to all the sand pads, <laughs> as many of them were out there, you know, type of thing. That was a, that was a lot of fun there. Um, not only uh, sand pans, but I was thinking about the times that uh, we wanted to have a good meal, and uh, uh, we would take and fly with the uh, Army helicopters. Mm -hmm. And uh, on my day off, I'd go out and fly with the Army helicopters to, to bring mail to the front line. And uh, we'd take and drop our mail and then come back home. And, and the Army would, would reward us and give us cases of steaks. And we used to take the steaks and bring them on our aircraft and cook them and have a great meal while we're out flying a mission. Cook them in the air. In the air. Yeah. At the galley. Oh yeah, we had to have a galley. We, mm -hmm. we uh, as uh, our missions ran anywhere from 12 to 19 hours. Oh, that's so it's you, a long you, day. Yeah, yeah. So normally we carried two meals apiece for us. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, where we have in-flight kitchens and on most of the bases, right. and you get your meals there for mm -hmm. for uh, in the, each individual. So, um, but my actual job on the aircraft was to uh, maintain uh, anything that had a wire coming out of it. Whether it be the autopilot, whether it be the nav system, whether it be the, uh, the generators, besides the radar and the radios. All you know, electronics. All electronics. Anything that had a wire coming out of it we were responsible for because we were the only technicians when we were airborne. The, on the see. ground, mm -hmm. they had people that took care of these mm -hmm. other systems. Right. But, uh, and I've seen times when I've had to change some equipment around that uh, I didn't know anything about. <laughs> but uh, I learned, you know, there and uh, being uh, on that aircraft for 20 years, I could probably trace almost every wire in that aircraft. I imagine you know, so. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you just become so familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Um, after I left the service, um, I went into, uh, uh, I was manager of a, a restaurant for a year, and then I went back into civil service. But I went into a completely different field, motor generators. Before, before we get into that, 
Must, uh, you were there during the uh, Kennedy assassination. Yes, uh, that was when well, we were there for both the Kennedy assassination. I was flying a mission out of Otis at that time, and I was down by the Carolinas, mm -hmm. and uh, they diverted our aircraft over to, to the area where he got shot, and uh, uh, we stayed up there another three, four hours, making sure there was nothing, nothing happened before we recovered back at Otis. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, when the Cuban mission, mission right. crisis was going on, uh, we were very involved in, in that. Uh, we had a, uh, a squadron that was actually set up at McCoy Air Force Base, the 966, and mm -hmm. uh, they flew their missions out of, out of there for Cuba. But before they set that up, we flew, uh, flew them out of, uh, out of Otis. And uh, I flew a couple of those missions, they called them Gold Digger missions. And uh, that was, uh, that's where, where they were, were out of, uh, out of uh, but we ended up uh, setting up an actual operating squadron at McCoy, so we'd mm -hmm. be closer to the Cuban. Mm -hmm. right. um, when I uh, completed my career after I had uh, uh, put almost every one of the uh, aircraft in the boneyard, uh, we uh, uh, went to uh, Homestead, Florida, and we took a active duty unit and integrated it with a reserve unit. Now that would prove to be interesting because uh, you can't tell a reservist that they have to work overtime, <laughs> okay? And, and our missions were still 12 hours, you know? Well, the reservists the were reservists on duty on for eight hours. Eight hours, right, right. And uh, I've seen times when we had to abort missions because the reservists wouldn't fly more than eight hours. and. Uh, so we got that straightened out after after a while. Uh, mm -hmm. They decided they'd pay them double time during during the next four hours, the last four hours of the mission, and what have you. And we got that straightened out, but it it didn't happen at the beginning, and and we had some, and we had some some real problems there as well, uh, trying to integrate uh, an active duty unit and a mm -hmm. reserve unit to, together. Um, it was it just didn't mesh that well, you know. Uh, uh, some of the things that you have to consider is that to stay current, you have to fly every 45 days. Okay, right. well, when they only come in once a month, some of the reservists, you know, uh, and they miss a month, well, you're already gone past the 45 days. Right. You know, and so, so we had some, some problem keeping them current as well. <clears throat> and, of course, the pilots as well have to do touch and goes. You know, and they have to have to have um, every 30 days. So, so mm -hmm. they had uh, some real problem trying to integrate the. Uh, that. But that was a kind of an interesting uh, mixture to, to to do that. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Let me talk a little bit about my uh, my family. Okay. I married a, a girl at Otis. Um, I met at the USO in in uh, in Falmouth and. Uh, uh, we were just as happy as a bug. We had three girls. We had a, uh, she had a problem. I brought her over to the base hospital and and uh, the doctor kind of told us it was all in her head. There was nothing wrong. Two days later, while I was at church, my wife died. Oh, and, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, and um, she had a blood clot. In her, in her, in a leg, and uh, and it got moved loose. up into her lungs and killed yeah. her. But the doctor said it was all in her head, you know. So we ended up uh, suing the the, the uh, government, uh, neglect causing a wrongful death action. Mm -hmm. They settled out of court with us, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, my dad was a um, manpower consultant to Africa under the Kennedy administration. Mm -hmm. And um, he was very good friends with Senator Norris Cotton from New Hampshire. And uh, they did a uh, Senate investigation of the, of the hospital at, the, at that base. Mm -hmm. um, the doctor that, that treated her was uh, found guilty of neglect 
and uh, was uh, uh, his right to practice was was taken from him. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, it was a that's a terrible tragedy, yeah, though. Yeah, and uh, two years later, I remarried and um, had uh, two more girls. Um, so you've got a total of five, five girls. girls. Five girls. In fact, they all lived in New Hampshire. And if you saw their license plates, you'd see sister one, sister two, sister three, sister four, and sister five, all, <laughs> all on their license plates. You know? That's unique. Yeah. And uh, um, then I, I lost my second wife uh, at 50. And uh, uh, I married the, my uh, maid of honor, my first wife and uh, spent uh, 10 years with her and lost her. Oh, so gee. I'm on my fourth wife. Oh, that's okay. rotten luck. Okay. And I married my uh, choir director at, uh, in Florida. And uh, she wanted to get out of Florida. Well, she was born here in Connorsville, right here at the hospital in Connorsville. So she wanted to come back to, to, to Indiana. So that's how I ended up in Indiana, being from New England, from New Hampshire. Uh, that's how I ended up here. That's quite a coincidence. Yeah. Uh, she is your fifth? Fourth. Fourth wife, and she's actually from home or from this area. Yes, yes. And we've been married 10 years now. Well, I think that's a marvelous story. Um, you've been very fortunate. But yes. uh, you were very fortunate in your military career and, uh, and in your personal life, I, it, even though it was dotted with tragedies. Uh, one of the uh, highlights of, of my, my civil service career. Mm -hmm. Now, I was uh, 22 years in the Air Force and 14 years in civil service. Mm -hmm. And I retired with 36 years of, of federal service. Mm -hmm. Now... Uh, one of the things I was really proud of uh, while I was in civil service is that uh, I was awarded uh, a medal for saving a person's life in a fire. How did that happen? Well, I was at a uh, Bible retreat during the, the night. I smelled smoke, and uh, I tried to find out where the smoke was coming from, and uh, a room was on fire and there was a guy sleeping in that room. So I, I crawled in and, and woke him up and, and got him out. And uh, I was credited with saving, saving his life. And, uh, uh, you and, did save his yeah, life. Right. So uh, the smoke that, would that have taken a, him. Yeah, that was a, um, and I, they did award me a medal for that uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, it, it's interesting that, you know, it, it all seems to come back around <laughs> because you see, where, I'm, where I am now, <clears throat> our headquarters was at Wright-Patterson, right here in Dayton. Oh. So that's where, where our headquarters was, and I had spent a lot of time at, at Wright-Pat only because of uh, uh, my civil service. Do you get uh, back over to Wright-Pat once in a while? <clears throat> Not as much as I'd like to. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think uh, uh, we just don't take the time to, mm -hmm. to go back. Um, as you know, we do have um, several aircraft, and oh, yeah. uh, the aircraft that I did fly, the, the mm -hmm. radar constellation. Um, if, if people were looking at what the radar constellation looks like, it actually, this is a mm -hmm. picture of the radar constellation. And you'll notice that it has the Air Force Outstanding Unit Award on the, on the aircraft. That was your aircraft? That was, that was our aircraft, yes. Outstanding. Yeah. So... Uh, there, let's. They, pilots used to say, "Say, uh, I have a hot enough time finding an aircraft with one tail. How do you fly them with three? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they didn't have a problem with it, no, actually. They they... <laughs> we also have a, a book that they uh, have written, 50 Fallen Stars. And uh, this is all about the... Uh, the three aircraft that we lost, and the names and the families of all those all those that we lost. Who put that together? Um, a radar uh, radio operator mm -hmm. did it, but one of my best friends, um, uh, Dean Boys, 
did a lot of the uh, of the research for him and did a lot of it and and he even uh, thanks uh, thanks uh, the dean in it for all of his hard work and and helping he said he couldn't put the book together without him right but uh, it's, it's this is about the uh, H model aircraft, and I said that's the one that carried. We had the extra equipment on the. Mm -hmm. That was the crew, latest, the latest model. A, yeah, our crew on the on the aircraft was uh, normally uh, the normal crew was was fourteen to fifteen people. Okay, uh, normally we had to carry a student too, or we may have ROTC. Someone else, right? Yeah, we might you know have so. Probably our crews would be anywhere 17, 18, 18 people on, on them. Um, I've flown as, with crews as high as 23 people, um, and, uh, but most of them are, are, and that consisted of two pilots and two engineers, two navigators, a radio operator, uh, two radar technicians, uh, a radar supervisor, a controller and four operators, radar mm -hmm. operators, and that made up our made up our crew. And your retired rank? I retired as master sergeant E7, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 my last year I spent at uh, Homestead Air Force Base, as I said, in, as an advisor to, advisor to the Air Force Reserve, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, one of my jobs there was to take the aircraft from uh, uh, the last aircraft we have in the inventory and bring them into uh, Davis Motham. And uh, I was on the crew that brought Triple Nickel into uh, the, uh, over here to Dayton to, uh, to the uh, oh, museum. For, for the museum here. Yeah, yeah. And the other, and so now all of the other aircraft went to Davis Monthan. To yes, they're in mothballs. In, uh, yeah, out in the desert. Out in the desert, right, right. It's, so, yeah, uh, but it's a. Uh, it's been a great career. I, uh, I really enjoyed being uh, being in the Air Force. I kind of missed that, you know, the all all get got together and oh, get yeah. things together. And do you that. have uh, are are there get-togethers yes. uh, once in a while that. We have a reunion every four years. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's out in it's set up out in California because ah. that's where the 552nd was out mm -hmm. there, and uh, we take that uh, we take and and meet uh, at different places uh, throughout throughout the uh, country. Um, they they met on Cape Cod. They met on Florida. They met in uh, Oklahoma at Tinker Air Force Base. Um, we met in Seattle, Washington. So uh, we kind of hit the whole area. At least you do go to them. Right. Once in a while. I haven't gone to all of them. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I do, uh, uh, we do have a uh, RV, a big recreational vehicle, and, mm -hmm. and we do try to go on a vacation every year. And, um, um, but this year uh, we're going to uh, uh, John Denver Week out in... Uh, oh. out in uh, um, Aspen, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. And we'll be there for a, for a week. That'll be so, good. So. Okay. Well, we're going to, uh, we're running out of time now. Um, I want to thank you for your service. You're more than welcome. Um, it's been a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. And I wish you the best. Thank you. Um, when is your next reunion coming? Um, there's one this year, and it's in New Orleans. Oh, okay. And uh, I don't think think we're going to make it this year, but okay. Uh, yeah, uh, but they what they do is they have uh, all the radar tech. Yeah, all the Connie people actually. It's not just the mm -hmm. radar technicians, but we always have a side meeting of all of the radar techs that we have. And, okay. Well, and uh, we have a, a website that we uh, all correspond on. So, so Robert, thank you for coming in and talking to us. Uh, about this. Uh, you've certainly had an interesting career and life. Thank you. And um, we're proud of you. Thank you for your service. You're more than welcome.